also that remind me. So those of you who are watching on YouTube, welcome. This is the Maths Lit Technical Maths Workshop. Uh, sorry, Maths Literacy Workshop. And we're just going to cover all the finer points for term two. Okay. So we were talking about Sharpies. Um, so if you are part of the Sharpies uh, program, you will get um, points for attending this webinar. And then once you've collected all of your points, you can exchange them for gifts like these headphones, um, the Bluetooth, Bluetooth um, wireless, I don't even know what that's called, speakers, sorry, <laughs> laptop bags, etc. So there's lots more gifts. These are just some samples of them. Uh, and then uh, what I will do is send you this PDF PowerPoint presentation on Monday, and then you can just click on the link and sign up to join Sharpies. And then if you want to share Sharpies with other teacher friends, they can also score points, then this is the link to share that with. Awesome. So some free downloads and resources. Uh, the simulator link will take you to the 535. Uh, GeoGebra is wonderful for doing things like break even points and so on and so forth. And then, of course, Maths at Sharp, which has got all of those free math literacy worksheets available. We will start doing more content um, once these webinars are finished. So you should have some new content up by the end of next month for math literacy as well. Um, and then, if you need the ATP documents, we have loaded them onto Maths at Sharp just purely. All of the maths, so math lit, technical maths, um, and pure maths for grade 10, 11, and 12. So uh, actually from grade four upwards, but <laughs> I assume that doesn't concern you. So for ATP documents, you can just click this link. It will tell you what is supposed to be covered per term. So according to the ATP documents, is what I've covered in today's session. Okay. Um, so the calculator we're going to be using is the beautiful W506T. Um, it is fantastic for math literacy, and I'll show you why in a few minutes. So just some very important buttons. Your mode button will take you to your different modes. The button underneath mode is backspace, that is for deleting things. And then, of course, your change button will change the way your answer looks. So normally the calculator might give it to you as a third or as um, a fraction. So you would just change that answer into a decimal. And then, of course, equals is the answer to world peace. No, I'm just kidding. Just gives you the solution. Um, so the modes that we're going to look at today is just normal stat and table. The rest are more for technical maths. Cool. So let's jump right in with finance. So the first thing that comes up for finance in grade 10 is a budget. Now, I wish actually that they would take this section and add it to LO because I feel like it's such a critical thing. And not only math lit students, math students should also know how to draw up budgets. And that's not part of their syllabus at all. So it makes me sad. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so this uh, link over here will take you to the place where I downloaded this budget from. And I'm just going to open it up so you can take a look at it and see um, what's available. So it's got a day to day section. It's got recurring, so those are your expected fixed expenses. It's got exceptions. So for example, if you went to the doctor, what um, would you pay for that? Because that's not a monthly expense, that's an out of the norm expense, okay? Um, your investments, your income and salaries, your rents, your medical aid refunds. I wish that that was a monthly expense as well. <laughs> income. <laughs> so this is a really nice one because it's quite thorough. It is created by Debt Rescue. So that will actually take you to a link. And Debt Rescue works through an entire article about how to, um, are you seeing this? Uh, let me just make sure. Okay, so Debt Rescue works through a whole article about um, working through a budget and what you should put. I actually think I might use this for myself. <laughs> but it's a really nice um, uh, budget to work through. And then, of course, the different kinds of expenses. So your fixed expenses are those costs that stay the same every single month. Your, um, if you have a cell phone contract, that would be fixed. But if you had a, a pay-as-you-go, that would be a flexible cost because you're only going to add um, airtime or uh, data to your phone depending on how much you use per month and you will add it as and when you need it. So that those costs might change. Um, your income is how much money you're earning per month. So that you need to include um, your salary, any rental income that you might get and so on and so forth. So just some 
important things. Then this is a till slip from a petrol station that I went to in December. Um, I just want to actually get my pointer. So, um, so here is where I purchased my petrol station, uh, petrol from. This is the date that it was purchased, um, the payment method. So this just shows you that this is a card that was swiped, uh, how many liters of petrol, so that's a nice tariff question. You can say, uh, if I paid 150 Rand for 10.519 10 liters, how much did my petrol cost per liter? Um, the total cost that we paid. And then of course, a nice question as well is your clicks club cards, so your reward programs. So if I'm swiping my card and I'm earning uh, 10 cents per liter, how much money did I get back on this transaction? Well, I, uh, I got 10 liters times 10 cents, is a whole whopping one round. Um, <laughs> so there's some nice ways that you can phrase these questions. Now there are um, questions like this on um, our maths workshops. So I will try and collate them and put all the links together for you on my day before I send out that email so you can find the worksheet. Then this is an online receipt. You know, when they went through that phase where they were, um, trying to save paper, so they decided to email it to you. Uh, I shopped at Mr. P home the other day for a birthday present, and they don't offer that anymore, which I thought was quite sad. Um, but just, uh, again, some important information here is your date that the email was sent, and there's your date as well. And then, of course, all your items purchased, including their barcodes, which is quite an interesting one. Um, this was before I had a baby, so I could afford to spend money. <laughs> and then, of course, your VAX, uh, VAT total. So this is after the 15% increase, oh, the increase in VAT. And then your total before your VAT, your after VAT total. And there's your actual cost of VAT. So you could actually just camp, close that out and ask kids what they actually pay. Um, then, of course, tariff system. Uh, I saw quite a few requests for tariff systems. So um, what what's really most important is that the students need to pay attention to the story details. And Mathlet, you do need to actually read the questions more so than than um, pure maths. Pure maths, you can sort of on the fly as long as you highlight the important stuff. But with Mathlet, you really need to understand what. The story is about before you try and answer your questions. So I've given two examples of different kinds of tariffs here. So the first one is a baker and she makes chocolate and vanilla cupcakes and then the cost per cupcake if you order less than 100 is six rand each and the cost per vanilla is five rand and then again if you order more than 100 five rand fifteen four rand fifteen each. Now it's interesting here to think about if I ordered 99 cupcakes at six rand each. I'm just going to do it quickly and just find my calculator. Here it is. So if I ordered six, um, I ordered chocolate cupcakes, I ordered 99, and they are six rand each, I would be paying 594 rand. But if I order 100 cupcakes, now they are 5 rand 50 each, then I'm only paying 550 rand. So it actually makes more sense to order the 100 cupcakes instead of the 99 cupcakes. I mean, that's a silly example. You'd probably order about 80 or so. But that's a nice question for, oh, sorry. Just, it's a nice question for your break-even analysis as well. So where do those graphs cross? So when is it better to order more than 100 cupcakes or um, and better to order less than 100? Okay, the other question uh, or other tariff system here is from a Sanit Bank account. So it's called MIMO Plus and MIMO Payments. Um, so the plus one, you pay a set fee of 105 Rand a month, and then you get all of the stuff included for free. Then your MIMO payment, your total cost for the account is five Rand, and then you pay for every transaction. So this is quite an interesting one in that um, you can actually balance where is it better if you're doing a lot of transactions to use the MAMO Plus versus to use the um, pay-as-you-go option, basically, on the standard bank account. So I thought it was quite an interesting one to look at and see um, what is actually in included. So if you wanted you count rewards, you can see you'd have to actually pay an extra 25 Rand, whereas this one is included in the budget. 
So just some interesting um, thoughts. Cool. So the next thing to look at is the simple interest rate. Now, if you haven't seen this before, it's, it's really quite fun. Um, so I'm just going to show you here. So what we're going to do is go to our table mode. And we're just going to look at what simple interest actually is. So if I type it into the calculator, let's say I invest a thousand rand a month. No, sorry, I invest an initial amount of a thousand rand. And the bank offers me 5% per annum, which is compounded, um, sorry, which is simple interest. Okay, so I'm going to just multiply by x for my n value. So it's just the basic formula that we're using. And I'm just going to scroll through the table. So at zero is the point where you actually invested your money. After one year, you're going to have 1,050 rand. So you earned 50 rand on your 1,000 rand. After two years, you have 1,100 rand. So you earned another 50 rand. So the entire time, you're just earning an extra 50 rand per year. So some nice questions that you can ask your students. Okay, so when does my money go? Well, 1,000 times 2 is 2,000. So I'm looking for the place where my money is 2,000 rand, which is after 20 years. Now, you can also do this with compound interest. So I'm going to leave the simple interest here and just do a compound interest function. Um, so this is 1 plus 5 over 100. Same, same values. I'm just changing the formula to do compound interest. So that's just the different formulas. Uh, and again, here we can see after the first year, it's still the same because they earned the same amount of interest. But the second year, your compound interest is actually earned an extra 2 and 50 because you're calculating 5% of the previous year and not the original amount like simple interest is doing. And you can see that it, it starts to add up um, as you go. Obviously, this is a very small interest amount and a very small um, investment. So it will take a long time to build up too. Um, a big amount. So the, the moral of the story is save as much as you can and get a compound interest account with the highest interest rate that you can. All right, so following on from simple interest, you get a higher purchase, um, which is part of simple interest. So I've actually just done a example to work through with you guys, okay? And it's actually taken from the Pure Maths grade 10, uh, but the questions are exactly the same. So what you need to do is uh, so a higher purchase is basically when you want something now but you take out a loan to pay it off and it is charged through you pay a deposit and then you pay um, your loan back which is based on a simple interest calculation okay so we are going to look here's your example so mendisa decides that she wants to purchase this lounge suite um, the lounge suite costs 14,999 rand. And here are the different questions. Uh, don't worry, the questions are repeated. So I'm not going to go through them now. So the first question is, if Mandisa pays a 15% deposit, how much will she have to take out for a higher purchase loan? So you can see the steps are done here for you. So what we need is to find out what 15% of 14999 is. And we can do that. And we see that it is 2,249 rand and 85 cents. And we just subtract that from our original loan amount, or original um, cost, which is 14 triple nine. So the loan, uh, the leftover amount that she's gonna have to take out a loan for is 12,749 rand and 15 cents. Now there is a nice shortcut for this, just to check that we are all correct. So I'm just gonna press my home button. Home just takes me back to normal mode from any other mode that I'm in, okay? So what you can do is also just subtract 15% from the original amount. So we're gonna say second function and percent, and that will show us exactly the same total that we had um, to take the loan amount for. But it is important to know what her initial deposit is. So you do actually need to do this calculation as well. Okay, so be sure to do both of them. But the first, this calculation that I showed you is just a really nice way to check that we've actually done our previous calculation correctly as well. So here's the shortcut steps um, for you that you'll get when I email you on Monday. Now, <clears throat> House and Home charges her 22% interest per year. That sounds 
astronomically high, uh, with the loan payable over three years. So what is the total amount Mandisa will have to pay back? Okay, so we need to find out firstly how much the total loan is going to cost. In fact, that's what um, the question is asking. So we're looking for your A. Here we've got 12,749 and 12%. 12 now, uh, I'm looking at this and I'm realizing this is not how we do it in MATLIT. We actually need to do it um, in a step-by-step -step fashion. So we're going to take this amount and add, uh, uh, actually, let's do this. We're going to multiply it by 22%, right? So that's going to give us, every year we're going to add 2,804 rand and 81 cents. And there's three years, so we're going to multiply it by three, and that's going to give us 8,414 rand and 44 cents. Okay, then we add that to the initial amount that we had, so 12,749 and 15 cents. And so the total loan repayment is going to be 21,000. 163 rand and 59 cents if we round it all correctly. Okay, so if you look here through my calculation, you'll see that it gives us exactly the same total value. So you can see that that method works just as well. And it only works for simple interest um, or higher compound, I'm um, sorry, for higher purchase um, calculations as well. So now that we're saying, if she pays a monthly insurance of 29 rand, and an admin fee of 13 rand, how much will she have to pay each month? So we need to actually take this value here and divide it by the number of months that she has to pay it back. So we know she's paying it over three years. There are 12 months per year. So that gives us a total of 36 months. Okay, and then we take this total and divide it by 36, and it gives us what we're paying for the couch, which is 587 rand, and we round it off to 88. Okay, then from there, we just need to add the admin fee and the insurance fee. And so her total that she's going to pay back on a monthly basis is 629 rand and 88 cents. So the question now is how much more is Mandisa spending because she bought the lounge suite on higher purchase than if she had just paid the cash price straight up? Okay, so she pays over 36 months and she pays 629 rand and 88 cents per month. So we multiply that by 36 and this gives us 22,675 rand. Now, how much more means we need to subtract the original um, from this total here. And then don't forget to include the deposit that she also paid. So in addition to the total loan that she's repaid, she's also paid a deposit of 2,249 rand. So we need to say those two added together and then subtracting the 14,999 gives us a total over and above what she would have paid cash is 9,926 rand. So almost 10,000 rand. She's paid back in interest and admin and insurance fees, which is a lot of money. So the moral of the story is um, save up in cash and then buy it. It will save yourself a fortune of money. All right, cool. <clears throat> so the next, are we all happy with that? Before I move on, are there any questions? If you're happy, don't you just want to wave your hand at me? Also, if you're still awake, <laughs> just uh, raise your hand and say hi. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Mama Chubby. All right, cool. So we uh, next topic is the inflation rate. So what I did is I looked at the petrol price in 2019 from January through to um, December. And what inflation is, is it's basically um, used to calculate how much pricing has increased over a certain period. Okay, so you can use monthly inflation rates, you can use um, your CPI inflate rate, which is your consumer price index, which is when they take a basic food um, basket. So what your um, lower income earners might purchase and they calculate the increasing cost price on those things. Now that's uh, for those who earn a slightly higher income is not actually an accurate rate of inflation because the 
basket has the very basic your know, mini meal, et cetera, et cetera. So it is um, not a great reflection. So what I did is I looked at your um, price of petrol. And so to find your inflation rate, you look at the oldest price or the new price, you subtract the original price, and then you divide it by your original or old price. And then of course, multiply it by 100. So let's do that quickly. I just want to move this so I can see. So here's our fraction. So we're going to say 15.88 minus 13.79 divided by 13.79. And then we multiply it by 100. And that gives us, change it, 15.16%. So the inflation rates on petrol, sorry, uh, the inflation rate for petrol is actually 15.16%, which is pretty high if you consider it over the last year. If we looked at an increase from here to our current date, you'll just cry, so I'm not going to do it. Uh, <laughs> then following on from the inflation rate is the exchange rate. And the exchange rate obviously has a direct influence on your petrol exchange. So that's also something to consider. It's not just the inflation on direct inflation. Um, so when I put together this webinar, uh, the rand, one dollar cost us 14 rand 52. So the way that I like to look at it is I look at the small amount, one rand stick or your one dollar, whatever the one is. So this is going from one and it's going bigger because it, 14 is bigger than one, basically. So if I have 10 dollars, how many rands do we have? So it's small to big and this one is to big, so it's going in the same direction, so we multiply. So we're going to say 10 times 14.52, and when we multiply by 10, we just move the decimal point one place to the right, so it's going to be 145 rand and 20 cents. Now, if we have a thousand rand, how many dollars can we buy? So now we're going in the opposite direction, we're going from big to small, so we have to divide. So let's find out what that is. So we're going to say 1,000 divided by 14.52, and that gives us $68.87 American cents. Okay. Now, what happens if we have it the opposite way around? So I have one rand, and it gives me 0 0.069 American cents. Okay, or well, 0, 0.069 dollars, right? So here we are going from big because one rand is bigger than 0, 0.069 to small. If we have 10 rand, how many dollars do we have? Again, so we're going from big to the small direction. In other words, from the rands to the dollars. So we're going in the same direction. So we multiply. So we're going to have 10 times 0, 0.069 gives us 69 cents. Uh, 69 uh, US cents. Okay. And if we have $100, how many rands do we have? So here we're going in the opposite direction. We're going from dollars to rands. So it means we need to divide. So we had 100 divided by 0 0.069, which gives us 1,449 rand and 28 cents if we round. Okay. Fantastic. So from here, we're going to go look at measurements. Um, so one of the nicest things, I need to actually change the slide before I send it to you. One of the nicest things on this calculator for math lit is the conversion function. So say, for example, we have 23 ounces and we want to convert ounces into grams. You know, when you have those recipes that say 23 ounces of cheese, cream cheese, or is it just me? Um, so what you do is you say alpha and you're going to press five for conversion. You see in blue it says convert, okay? And then all you do is you scroll through the table and you look for your conversion um, that you want to do. So here we can see inches to centimeters, centimeters to inches, feet to meters, meters to feet, and so on and so forth. And here it is. Ounces to grams is 13. So we just say we want the 13 conversion rate and then we say equals and it gives us 652 grams, or 652,04 grams. So we have managed to convert 
our answers to grams very quickly and very easily. It's a really nice way to check your calculation as well. Okay, so you do have 44 different options uh, for conversions, lots of nice different things um, to use. Um, also part of measurement is time calculation. So there are three different time calculations that I wanna show you here. So the first is if I have so many minutes, how many hours do I have? So let's say I have 470 minutes and I wanna know how many hours. So what you do on your calculator is you put a zero in the hours placeholder and we're gonna use your DMS button, which is this one here, DMS stands for degrees, minutes, seconds. Um, it's used uh, for geography calculations, but it uses the same number system as time. So we actually can use it for our time calculations as well. So we're gonna say zero, and then we have 470 minutes. We don't have any seconds, so we don't need to do anything else. And then we just say equals, and it gives us seven hours and 50 minutes. Now, if we want it as just hours, we can change it back into our normal number notation. So we press second function and the DMS button again, and then that gives us seven and five sixths of an hour. And if we change that, 7.83. Okay. Uh, your next calculation that we're going to do is your speed distance time calculation. Okay. So how long, if I travel 450 kilometers at an average speed of 117 kilometers per hour, how long does it take me to get to my destination? Okay, so 450 kilometers divided by 117 kilometers per hour gives me three hours and something, 3.84. So maybe 45 minutes maybe more than that. Let's check. So what we do is we say second function and DMS, and that gives me three hours, 50 minutes and 46 seconds. So that's a really nice one for time calculations as well. Now the last one is your subtracting and adding time. So this is the timetable question. So if the bus um, arrives at quarter to 10, and it leaves at half past 12. Um, how long was the bus at the station for? Okay, so again, we're gonna use our time notation and we use the later time first. So we're gonna say 12, 30 minutes for half past 12, minus nine, um, 45, okay, for quarter to 10 and equals, and it tells me that the bus was there for two hours and 45 minutes. And again, if I change it back, it's two and three quarters of an hour. Now, the other nice thing, and I didn't actually include it in the slides, is if you want to go from hours to seconds, or hours to minutes, you can also do that. So let's say, for example, we have 52 hours and we want to know how many seconds that is. Now, here we press the math button and we just see there it says two seconds. So we just press one and it tells me that there are 187,200 seconds in 52 hours. If I wanted to do it with minutes, so I have 52 hours and I want to find out how many minutes that is, then I can just use two and it tells me that it is 3,120 minutes. So again, it's just really nice shortcut, particularly for math lit calculations. I know time is always such a struggle um, for students as well. Cool. From here, let's talk about BMI, which was also one of those um, lovely questions. So <laughs> when I was researching or putting this together, I found an article saying, you know, you can't just look at a person's BMI, you have to look at other underlying factors as well. Um, so this is just your first step uh, into diagnosing problems and issues. Um, so it's just something to, to be aware of when you look at BMI and when students, in fact, calculate their own BMI. Okay. So uh, here, BMI is calculated by taking your weight in kilograms and dividing it by your height in meters squared. Okay, so let's look at our example. Tony weighs 120 kilo kilograms and he is 1.85 meters tall. What is his BMI? So let's quickly jump over to your calculator. So I'm just on. So we're going to just use the fraction button. You can use either fraction or divide, whatever makes you happy. So he is 120 kilograms 
and his height is 1.85 meters. And then you can just use your squared button like so, and that will include the entire thing. And equals, so his BMI is 35.06. So 35 basically if we round it off. Now let's go look at our table. So 35 is greater than 30, which means he's falling into the obese category. So he actually needs to go and look at his weight. Now, Tony might be a bodybuilder, in which case he wouldn't be considered obese because his fat ratio and whatever muscle ratio is different. But it is something to think about and consider um, when you look at these types of questions as well. All right, uh, calculating surface area. So for this one, um, I've just given the formula for the cube and the rectangular prism. And I just wanted to show you how easy it is to substitute in. And I'm going to do it two ways. So the first is just to literally substitute in your various values. So if the tissue box is 12 centimeters across, 10 centimeters high, and 20 centimeters wide, what is the surface area of the box? So we're going to have 10 times 20 plus 2 times 10 times 12 plus 2 times 12 times 20. Okay. And then equals, so our surface area is 1,120 centimeters squared. Don't forget your units. Now, the, another nice way to do this is actually to save those values. So the 10 we can save into our A. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry store it in A. Our B we can we can say is 20, we still store it into B. And then 12 we'll store into C. So you just need to pay attention to what you put uh, into each letter. Okay. Now for surface area, we're just going to say 2 times A times B plus 2 times A times C plus 2 times B times C. So there's two of them, each of them. Okay. And equals, and again, it gives us the same answer, 1,120 centimeters squared. So it's just, again, a nice way to use substitution, um, particularly for those students who tend to make mistakes and who um, struggle with this sort of stuff. And then again, it's all those values are saved for you. So if you need to do a different calculation, you've already got it in the calculator as well. Okay. Awesome. So the next section that we're going to look at is uh, math scales and representation. So I just briefly went through here. Um, so scale is basically a ratio calculation. Um, and it's, uh, ratio is quite a critical skill to have in math lids. And if you join the Sharpies um, program, the, one of the free, exclusively free content that you'll get is a ratios worksheet. Um, so just a Heads up, a good reason to join Sharpies. Uh, so if you look at your um, map scale, so our map scale, for example, we say is one centimeters to every two kilometers. So it's quite a, a dense map. I mean, it's, it's gonna cover a lot of area. If you measure six centimeters on the map, so that is the measurement on the map, what is the measurement in real life? So how did we get from one to six? We multiplied by six. So what we do to this one side of the ratio, we have to do to the other side of the ratio. So it's going to be 2 times 6. So our measurement in real life will be 12, and we need to use this measurement, kilometers. If your park measures 3 kilometers by 4 kilometers, what will its area be on the map? So now we're going from this side. So how did we get from 2 to 3? We... Um, Oh, we need to go backwards. How do we get from three to two? We need to divide it by. I'm being very silly here. Um, how do we get from, yeah, anyway. So it is dividing by two. So we're gonna say three divided by two is 1.5 centimeters because you're going in this direction here, that's why. So how do we get from three to whatever our ratio should be? We're gonna divide it by two. And then again, four, how do we get from four to our centimeters? We need to divide it by two to get that same ratio. So it's going to be two centimeters. Awesome. Now, giving directions is, <laughs> and taking directions is a very important skill. And it's part of language skills as well. 
Um, so it's something that, that all students should actually know how to do. Um, and I still can't take directions. So I get all flustered in grade grade. <laughs> so it's a really important skill to have. Now, this is a map that I downloaded from Goldie City. And I, I really like it because it's got quite a nice setup. You've got your grid system with your letters there. Um, so for example, town square would be in C3. Okay, and then it's also got all of your legends and all the different places that you could visit. I don't know if you can see it so well on my screen, but if you download it yourself, it, it's a bit bigger and then you can, and if you click on this link, it will literally take you to the place where you can download this map yourself. So if you wanted to do something like this with your students or project it on the projector and make it really big and then they can plan how they would visit the park as a fun exercise to do perhaps. Okay, awesome. So our next section is probability. Are we all good still? We're all still alive and awake. No questions. Fantastic. Okay, great. Awesome, awesome. So on your calculator, you have a random function. And it's really nice because it gives you a whole bunch of options. So random does random decimals between 0 and 1 to three decimal places. And what you can do is actually just multiply them together to get bigger decimals, like so. Um, and then you can practice rounding off to so many decimal places um, with your students because it keeps generating new questions. You've got fantastic opportunities to, to practice um, without you having to set any questions. You can say, okay, practice 10 and go. And then because they all have different questions, they can switch with their friends. So their friends are practicing, checking for mistakes and errors as well. Uh, you also have a dice, which is exactly uh, like a dice. So it gives you one to six. Your coin is a math coin. So it does uh, zeros and ones. I'll show you quickly. So it just does, so it's exactly the same probability, 50% heads, 50% tails, 50% zero, 50% one. And then of course, random integers, really epic um, because you can put any two numbers uh, in that slot. So you can say, I want numbers between one and 52. You wanna play the lottery with your students. And then of course you can generate random lottery numbers. So what I will do with students is I will ask them to write down their six lottery numbers between one and 52. And once they're done, they switch their piece of paper with their friend next to them. If you're doing Zoom, you can put it into the chat function as well. Um, and then I'll generate the random numbers on my simulator. Uh, guys, remember you can download the simulator for free. The link is in the presentation. So uh, don't panic if you wanna play this game. And then of course, it, we see if anyone actually wins, or comes close to getting uh, any of the values that we've shared. Now, part of probability is looking at your theoretical probability versus your relative frequency. So your theoretical probability is the actual expected outcome that you um, want based on the information that you have. So if I have a six-sided dice, I expect that when I roll the dice six times, I'm gonna get a one once, a two once, a three once, a four once, and so on and so forth. But that's not reality. And that's where relative frequency comes into play. So relative frequency um, basically is the results of your experiment. So in, if you roll the dice 10 times, how many ones, how many twos, how many threes, et cetera. Okay. So what you can do in class with your students is get them all to roll the dice once. And then you create a tally table on the board and you ask, okay, who got six? And you count how many hands, write it on your tally table. Who got three, who got et cetera, et cetera. And then you can do a total. And you can do a couple of rounds so that you can get, um, you know, lots of data together. And you can actually look at how each value in your total starts to tend towards your expected um, frequency or your theoretical probability eventually. So it's a really nice exercise to do in class and it really brings the difference between these two uh, to life with the students as well. Now, tree diagrams um, are another way of representing probabilities. And there are two different ways of looking at um, probability with tree diagrams. So the first one is with replacement. So basically that is when you have a bowl or something um, and you're taking marbles out and you look at the probability. Say you have um, a red, blue or green marble inside your bowl 
and you take the red one out. So the probability of getting red is one out of three, right? Then with replacement means that I put the red marble back inside my bowl and I spool them around and then I look at the probability of pulling another marble out of the bowl. So again, the same, it will have the same probability because there are three marbles. But if I kept the red marble outside uh, after I drew it the first time, then I only have a green or a blue marble to choose from. So my odds of choosing a green marble are now 50% and my odds of choosing a blue marble are now 50%. So you can see that the probability has changed because of the impact on the, of the previous round of, of taking out the red marble. I hope that makes sense. So this here is actually a solution to a probability question from one of the math literacy um, worksheets that we've done. So a spinner with five equal parts numbered one to five, and then another spinner with three equal parts with the colors red, blue, and yellow. So here you can see because they are equal, all of their probabilities are exactly the same. So this is one out of five, one out of five, one out of five, one out of five, and your probability of choosing red, blue, or yellow is one out of three. And then of course you can see all of your options when they are combined together, or if you spin the two together. Okay. Now, two-way table um, shows us the relationship between two categorical variables. In other words, um, they are not numerical, so they are categories like men and women, red and blue, pink and green, um, BSC, BA, uh, VW, Toyota, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so it's not a quantifiable option. Okay, so it doesn't give us a way to graph the figures. So that's why it is a table. Okay, so there's two ways to read the probabilities from the table. The first is your big picture probability. In other words, your total maths students and your total math lit students. Okay, or your total men or your total women. Okay. Now, when I did this table, I actually just used the random function and chucked values in here, and it actually works out really well for some unknown reason. Um, so you can see that, in fact, there are an even number of men and women, okay, for a total of 148 students, but 71 students are taking maths and 77 are taking math lit. So the chances of drawing a student who takes just maths is going to be this column here, your total column. So it's going to be 71 out of 148. Okay. Whereas your chance of drawing a woman is going to be 74 out of 148, which is actually a half. Now, the second way is to look at specific details. In other words, the combination of two things. So what is the chance of drawing a man who takes math lit? It's 28 out of 148 students. What is the chance of a woman taking maths? It's 25 out of 148 students. So it's very important to pay attention to what they're asking you. Have they combined the two or are they asking for a single variable? Okay. Um, so some random things to do uh, that you can play with your calculator, obviously create that tally table that we spoke about originally. Um, you can also create a poll on Zoom if you're using Zoom still. Um, you can play Snap either in the classroom or in breakaway rooms on Zoom. Uh, don't worry about the testing multiples unless you're also teaching a senior phase, in which case we'll cover that next week when we do the senior phase workshops. Um, and then, of course, the lottery, which uh, I love because it is just so much fun to play with your students. Okay, our last section of the day is data handling. Is everyone still good? Feeling alive? No crazy, crazy yet. Okay, awesome. All right. So um, the first thing that we look at in data handling is collecting data. And you need to keep an eye out for biased data. Now, last week we had this all of this drama about the J&J &J vaccine and how there were 6.6 6 women and 6.8 million who had blood clots. Um, and so I saw this interesting um, uh graphic, which is based on deaths in the United States, and the chances of you dying from a blood clot in each of these. So in a motor vehicle accident, the chances of you getting a blood clot is one in 107 um, accidents, which is quite 
high odds, actually. And then the chances of getting a blood clot from being shot with a firearm is one in 289. And then a plane crash is one in 188,364. And then your blood clots for your J&J &J is one in 1,133,333. Uh, sorry, 1,133,333. 1, um, so you can see that actually it's a tiny, tiny percentage of people and is probably more likely related to just having the COVID uh, virus as well. So it's just something to think about. So don't panic, okay? And then of course, look at your sample versus your population, okay? So this data coming from J&J &J is more likely a population question. Uh, rather than a, just a, a tiny, tiny sample. The sample is six out of 6.8 million. I mean, you can make no feasible um, statistical conclusions from this. And then um, look at the choice of your sample. So who, who is the sample? Um, how, why did you choose a sample that size or that group of people? How did you choose that sample? Um, and so on and so on. So this, um, I know a lot of people struggle with pie charts. So I just wanted to show you a nice and easy way. So this is the original way to do it. And I want to just show you a very nice shortcut. And it works the same way as you calculate your class box. So if you haven't seen this, you can use it to calculate your class box in the same way. So let's say, for example, um, we've got these colors. And the first color is 31, the total number of people that we interviewed was 190. And now we want to create a pie chart, which has a total of 360 degrees. So where are we going to is going towards a total of 360 degrees. The total that we have is 190. And we have 31 red answers. So we say equals, and that gives us 58.74, or just 59, because it's very difficult to draw comma seven of an angle. Okay, so 59 degrees. Then your next option, uh, blue was 33. So all I'm gonna do is type in 33 and say equals, and that gives me an angle of 60 and we'll round it off to 63 degrees. Your next one was orange and it was 42. So I type in 42 and I say equals, and that gives me an angle of 79 or basically 80 degrees. So you can see it's a really nice short method um, for quickly finding the degrees on your calculator as well. Cool. Um, so let's look at box and whisker plots. So firstly, we need to find our five number summary. So, and our five number summary is your minimum, your maximum, median and then the middle of your minimum and max and median which is your quartile one and the middle of median and maximum which is quartile three and then we draw our box and whisker plot okay so <clears throat> here is our example with our data that's my box and whisker plot so what i've just done is i've just showed you where the points are so your maximum will be this end piece here your quartile one is this line here your median is the middle line your quartile three is the other line of your box and your maximum is the end whisker. Okay. Now on your calculator, I just wanna go back to the start because it will be much easier. We can actually use the stats function to find our uh, data, I'm sorry, our uh, five number summary. So I'm just gonna go to stat and one for stat and zero for signal data. Oh, and it's already tapped in. Let me just uh, clear it and then we'll go back. So to clear second function and mode. Okay, now let's type our data in. So it's 52 and equals, 53 and equals, 71 and equals, 75 and equals, 75 and equals, 76 equals, 79 equals 82 equals and 96 equals. Okay, when you are done and you are happy with the data, so if you scroll through, you can press the change button. If you realize that you've made a mistake and you want to go back and change something, just highlight whatever it is that you want to change, type the new value in, press equals, and it will just overwrite it for you. Sorry, I didn't want to change the actual value because then it's going to change the answers. <laughs> okay, 
Now, <clears throat> once that's done, we can say alpha and eight. You'll see above eight in blue, it says stat. So that means blue key and eight. And then all we do is we use zero. And if we just scroll through the table, here's your minimum, quartile one, median, quartile three, and maximum. Cool. So that's a very nice, easy, quick way to get your whole file number summary. And um, these are the steps that you can follow to do it on the calculator once um, you have your own calculator with you. So this is an example question of a box and whisper plot um, that I actually took out of the, one of the questions, one of the worksheets that we set up. Okay. So below is a box and whisker plot of the dot for Danielle scores out of 50. She received for 20 different dance routines she did over the last six months. So give the range. So we know the range is your maximum, which is the end whisker, and minus your minimum. So our range is just going to be 49 minus 7. Then how many scores did Danielle get between 24 and 41? So this is one quarter of the data. You can see your median and quartile 3 means it's a quarter of the data is between 24 and 41. So a quarter of 20 is 5. So Danielle got five scores between 24 and 41. How many scores did Danielle get between 17 and 41? So now we've got quarter, one quarter, plus another quarter gives us half, right? So it's going to be half of the data. So half of 20 is 10. What can we say about the spread of Danielle's scores? Well, her lower scores are quite close together and her higher scores from 24 and upwards are much higher or much more spread out. Okay. If Danielle's top 25% of scores, in other words, your top quarter, which is this one here, occurred in the last two months, what can we say about Danielle's dancing? Well, if all of these occurred in the last two months and the rest of these occurred before that, it means that her dancing has improved um, because she's getting better and better scores. Now, in order to go through to the next round, you need to score more than 40. In how many competitions did Danielle go through to the next round? Well, more than 40 is here at 41. So that's a quarter of the quarter. So again, a quarter of 20 is five. So she went through two, five of the next rounds for her dancing competition. Cool. And again, uh, just to go back to your data on your calculator, everything here is summarized for you. So N is your number of observations. The next one is your mean, which is your average. Uh, you won't find the mode on the calculator. Um, that is something that you'd have to look at directly from your data. Your median is here in that five number summary. And then, of course, your range, you would just say your maximum minus your minimum, which is given to you here. Okay, so that's just a nice quick way to get to all of the data that you require as well. All right, fantastic. So that brings us to the end of uh, this term two session for MAPLET. I hope you found it useful. Um, and then, of course, everyone that has attended today is going to receive their very own W506T. For those watching on YouTube, thanks so much for joining us um, and please subscribe. Um, if you like to watch 